Hi everyone, thanks for joining me on another demo. I'll start by introducing myself. I'm John Adeoja, founder and chief data scientist at Data Centric Solutions. Today, I want to demo to you how to build more capable large language models with a method called retrieval augmented generation. So let's just talk a bit about why we would want to build more capable large language models. We can illustrate this by looking at the limitations of chat GPT as an example. So for many practical business use cases, you will find that chat GPT is actually fairly limited. Here's why. We know that chat GPT was trained on data up until September, 2021. So if you're looking for practical, so if you're looking for factual information that happened or occurred after 2021, you might get a response that looks a bit like this. I've asked the model, was there an earthquake in 2022? And the response I get is, I'm sorry, but I don't have real time information on events that occurred in 2022, as my knowledge was last updated in September, 2021. You may want to consult a reliable up-to-date source as a news website or a government agency that monitors seismic activity for the most accurate information on recent earthquakes. Is there anything else I can assist you with? Obviously, this isn't very helpful. So what can we do about this? There are two practical options. Option one, train or fine tune the model on up to date data. Fine tuning is something that is doable, but it's actually quite impractical and expensive. You know, putting aside the costs for a minute, the effort alone required to prepare the data sets for fine tuning is enough to forego this option. Option two, use retrieval augmented generation methods. RAG methods are actually pretty easy to implement. There are frameworks that exist now that can allow us to implement those quite quickly. I'll go into the details in this video about how we can use RAG methods so that we can answer questions that are beyond the training data that the large language model was trained on. Let's talk a bit about libraries and prerequisites. If you do want to implement this approach yourself, you will need an OpenAI API key. I believe there is still a free tier offered by OpenAI. You simply need to sign up to OpenAI and follow the instructions to get yourself access to an OpenAI API key. The other libraries we'll be using is Haystack, which provides us with all of the APIs and frameworks we need to for our RAG method. And we'll be leveraging some open source models from Hugging Face. Now we will get into some of the technical details around how we can augment up, how we can enable our models with RAG methods. Before getting into the technical details around the build itself and looking at any code, I think it's worthwhile covering some foundational topics about how these large language models work. The key thing to understand here is really around sentence embeddings because that will give you a better intuition for how RAG methods work, if you can understand the concept of sentence embeddings. So at this point, this might seem a bit cliche, but especially if you are from a data science or machine learning engineering background, but models don't actually understand text. Models don't actually interpret text, they interpret numbers. We need to be able to represent 
numbers, we need to be able to represent text in a way that models can understand. And we do this via sentence embedding. Essentially with sentence embedding, we find a way to represent a sentence as a vector. It's usually a dense vector that the model can then translate and perform operations on. And that's how models learn to interpret the text that we feed them. For our particular use case, we will leverage some pre-trained models to help us generate those sentence embeddings. These are all available from Hugging Face. So I will get on Hugging Face and just show you what that looks like. So just stepping into the sentence transformer library provided by Hugging Face, there are a number of sentence embedding models pre-trained that we can leverage to generate sentence embeddings for our retrieval augmented generation process. Now, if it's not clear to you how this all fits together, please continue to watch. It will become more clear as I step through the pipeline. At this point, I think it's a good time to have a high level view of what the RAG pipeline looks like. So retrieval augmented generation, what do we even mean when we say that? We are basically giving the large language model access to a knowledge base in the form of text documents. So these text documents can be PDFs, they can be Word documents, or they can be pure text. We take that through various steps, and this is what you see on screen now. So in our document store, we have our knowledge base, and this is on any item that we wish to give the large, large language model knowledge on. We pass through some document pre-processing. Once the documents have been uploaded, they are vectorized and stored in a vector data set. There'll be more information on this later down the line. Just hold this in mind at a high level for now. And then we pass it through an extractive question answering pipeline. And I'll get into more details about how that extractive question answering pipeline works later on in the video. But just for now, what you need to understand about retrieval augmented generation is we have a knowledge base at the top here, the document store. There's some document pre-processing and storage of those documents in vector form. Uh, just think back to what we talked about briefly with sentence embeddings. That's how we're storing those documents. And then this is passed to a extraction, extractive question answering pipeline where we can search for relevant information that enables us to search for relevant information in that document store or in that in, across that knowledge base. Fantastic. Let's get into some of the details about the document pre-processing. The best thing is to step into the code so we can understand exactly what we mean and what we're doing with the document pre-processing. So as you can see, I've already imported my Haystack dependencies and um, the dependencies we're talking about here are the preprocessor, uh, convert files to docs and the base document store. So let's just walk through what we're doing with this document preprocessing. So the first function I have defined here is to preprocess our documents. Haystack is really handy for this because it actually provides a function that takes abstracts away a lot of the complex coding that you need to do in order to pre-process process documents in the format that Haystack requires further downstream. And this is all done through this convert files to docs function. So your convert files to docs function can actually work on your document store. So you just need to provide the directory or the path to your document store. 
and it will automatically detect what the extension of that document is or of the documents in the document store read those in and pre-process them in a way that is that you've defined in the pre-processor uh, class that's quite fantastic so i've written the function to to do that all in one step there's a few things to note here your documents in the knowledge base can be quite long so for example if you're taking a wiki wikipedia file it could be tens of thousands of words long or even longer in some cases Obviously, we, we are not processing all of that in one chunk. We're not vectorizing all of that in one chunk. What we need to do is split that up into manageable chunks or sentences. And our preprocessor class enables us to do that. We do that by defining the split length which is the number of words that we want each chunk, each sentence chunk to be. And then there is also a split overlap that we can define. So how many, how much overlap is there between one sentence and another? It's said to be good practice to have some overlap when it comes to question answering tasks, which is what we're essentially trying to achieve when we're building the RAG pipeline. What we return from running this function is um, our formatted documents or our formatted knowledge base. This can then be taken on and processed in, um, it can be vectorized so we can form our sentence embeddings from here. And you know we need it in this form to be able to process it downstream. The next step is to define our vector store. So I'm using a library, uh, which is also provided alongside the Haystack API called Face, which is a vector store provided by Meta. It's open source and you would use this for storing those sentence embeddings that we create from our formatted document. So why, why do we use face in the first place? Well, face enables us to do efficient similarity search across those sentence embeddings. Essentially, we get a query about our knowledge base and we're able to do a search, a similarity search between that query and the sentence embeddings that we have processed and stored in our vector store, which is face in this case. It's quite easy to define and it works with SQLite. So you can define this in memory. I wouldn't advise it because you quickly reach limitations with the size of the knowledge base you're working with. But what I've what I've done here is to define a local, um, a on disk space to create that database that we're storing those sentence embeddings in. So our, our vector store is on disk, it's, it's local. If you're going to run this yourself, you need to change this location to a local location you have on your on your own um, desktop or laptop, wherever you're running it. Another key point to note here is that this embedding dimension, which I've denoted as 768 dimensions, has to be the same number of dimensions as your sentence transformer that you will use. And I'll get onto more detail about how this vector store works with the sentence transformer a bit later on. But the key takeaway here is we need the vector store to be able to store our sentence embeddings for search and retrieval that we're going to perform on those later on. That's probably a lot, but let's just take a step back to understand where we are here. So what I've shown you is the code for the document processing steps. So we've read our documents in from the document store. So our, our document store contains our knowledge base. We've read that in, and that could be of the, the form of a PDF or a docx document, a Word document, or it could be a text document. 
we've applied pre-processing by splitting that document from one large chunk of text or you know several paragraphs of text to smaller manageable chunks we have then defined our vector store database which that vector store database which will make it easy for us to perform search and retrieval uh, based on similarity matching further down the line So this step, the data preprocessor step is essentially just the setup and the script for this is just 37 lines. Again, this is gonna be available to you on GitHub to look into and play with yourself. So the link for the entire project will be in the description for this video. Now let's look at the next step, which is to create our pipeline. So defining our extractive question and answer pipeline. How are we doing this? Well, first of all, we have to understand the concept of a pipeline. So a pipeline consists of nodes, which you can think of as operations things that take an input and return an output. So if you're mathematically minded, you might think of this as a function. These nodes are executed sequentially and in a defined order. What we have here, if you imagine, is we want to give our large language model access to a knowledge base so that we can ask questions about that knowledge base. We can do this by defining an extractive question and answer pipeline. So there are two nodes in this pipeline, re a retriever node and a reader node. And I'll go into details about what each of these do. So let's talk about the retriever node, first of all. So retrieval is a method used to find relevant information from a knowledge base based on the user's query. So again, we, as the user of this model or this approach would ask a question about a knowledge base and our retriever will go into our knowledge base, which is kept in our vector store and find the areas that are semantically similar to the question we've asked. So find all of the sentence embeddings that are similar to the question that we've asked. How does it do this exactly? So you might have noticed that we've actually defined two things here, our document store, which came from our data pre-processing. So if we step back into the vector stores, what you'll see here is that the what we output from this function is a document store, which is essentially all our, it's the, the index of all our sentence embeddings for our knowledge base, right? So we've defined that in our question, extractive question and answer pipeline for the retriever. So we've got our document store there. And then we've also defined an embedding model. And this embedded model it comes from Hugging Face, Sentence Transformers, as I've explained earlier, this is already pre-trained. You can actually see the embedding model here. So let's just pull, pull that up to give you a better understanding. So we've used the all MP base MP NetBase version two. And that should be available here. If we go into the search, it should just pull up just to give you a better idea. So this is the embedding model we've chosen and it is 768 dimensions. Before we move on, I think we should just talk a little bit about the dimensions of the embedding models themselves. So this is to create the sentence embeddings. If there is a there, there is a trade-off between the size of your sentence embedding, which again is, if you remember, if you recall, it's a vector representation, a dense vector representation of your sentences. Larger models, larger dimensional um, vectors have the propensity to retain more information or more structure. Um, this could be semantic structure about the sentence. 
at the cost of computational efficiency. So this type of sentencing building model, a larger, the larger the model, maybe it takes a little longer to create, to generate those sentence embeddings, but you get to preserve more of that semantic structure within the embedding than say, if you were to use a smaller model, which would take less computational resources, but would also perhaps lose some of that semantic information in the structure. Once we have defined our retriever, we can run the update embeddings process on that retriever. So remember our document store is a vice vector store and we run this, we run the update embeddings method on uh, with the retriever that we've defined and that will convert all of our that will convert all of our um, documents that have already been pre-formatted and split up into their sentence embeddings. The reader is the next step in the node. So what does the reader do? The reader takes the output of the retriever, which is selected sentence embeddings, so the reader, the, the retriever, not only converts those documents into sentence embeddings, but it will provide the match or the similar, the sentence embeddings that are similar to the query that we have. And it returns the top K number of sentence embeddings based on their similarity score. The reader then acts on that output. So let's talk a little bit about what the reader does. Again, we've used the functionality provided from Haystack, which is the farm reader. So the reader is a large language model that has been fine-tuned on question answering tasks. So for this use case, I have just defined the reader as the Roberta base squad two reader. So that's just a large language model again, which is available from Hugging Face. So we can get into the model card just to give you some idea of where that is. So as you can see, the model has been fine tuned on the squad two data set, and it's been trained on question answer pairs, including unanswerable questions for the task of question answering. And they've got an example here of which name is used to describe the rainforest in English and they provided some context, and I think if you press, um, if you press compute here, you'll get an answer. So this is quite a basic model. It's just pro it's been fine tuned on question answer pairs. That's the the thing to take away from all of this. What does the retrieve? What does the reader do once you know with that model with the fine-tuned question answer model. Well, what the reader does is it operates on the output from the retriever and the initial query from the user. So we might get a query on our knowledge base, for example, how many cars were in Brooklyn on the 15th of June, 2022. We might have the answers to this in our knowledge base. The retriever looks at the converts the query into a sentence embedding and looks at the sentence embeddings in our document store that we've already defined, then performs a similarity match on those sentence embeddings between our query and our document store, returns the top K most similar embeddings to our initial query. And that top K we can actually define as a parameter so it could be 10, it could, K could be 10, K could be 15, it could be five. That's a degree of freedom that you get to play with as the, the engineer. Once that has been done, that is then that top K list is passed onto our reader. Then our reader looks at this list and selects the response that answers the question for us. And 
there is a confidence score. It doesn't just select one response, it returns again a top K responses to the answer um, to, to that it believes answers our query. And there is a confidence score associated with all of those responses. So it's organized from, it's ordered from the highest confidence to lowest confidence response. Taking a step back, if we look at this from a really high level view without technical terminology, the reader, the retriever, selects the relevant part of our knowledge base and the, ret the retriever answers our questions from that relevant part of our knowledge base. That's how we can augment our lat natural language models to answer questions that they have not been trained on. Fantastic. So again, this is kind of testament to how powerful Haystack is as a tool, because that whole extractive question answering pipeline with our retriever and our re reader can be defined in just under 18 lines of code, which is very useful, especially when you, you're looking to build prototypes and get them up and running and in front of your stakeholders really quickly. Great. So we have talked about our document pre-processing, which is reading in our documents from our knowledge base, reformatting them so they can be used downstream and then defining our vector store. And then we've talked about our extractive question answering pipeline, where we have defined our nodes, our retriever, which isolates the relevant parts of our knowledge base and our reader, which finds the appropriate responses to the question or the query that we've asked. What next? There is one more step here, and this comes in the form of an agent. Let's talk a little bit about agents and how they make this whole thing possible. Because without an agent, really, it's quite hard to get quality responses from just the reader and retrieval method alone. So how does an agent work? So agents are actually powered by large language models. In our case here, we are using OpenAI's GPT-4 to power our agent. How does an agent work? Now, this is kind of a, a simplistic overview that just applies to this approach because there are many different types of agents. But essentially, an agent has access to a set of tools that we define and we give it access to. The agent has the ability to comprehend the query, and you've seen this already because if you use chat GPT, the model behind that, GPT-4, can understand your queries. So the agent has the ability to comprehend your query. The agent also has the ability to make observations. These observations come from the responses it gets after using a tool or after executing on a tool. That's the power of an agent. And it's kind of summarized here. So at a really simplistic high level, and we will get into more detail about how agents operate. An agent will receive a query, then it will have a thought, it will think about how it needs to respond to that query by, and the thought is based on the tools, right? So it think about, okay, I need to search for the number of cars in Brooklyn on the 22nd of November, 2022 let's say. Then it will look at the tools available to it. And those tools could be anything from a search um, extractive question answering pipeline that we've defined earlier. It could be a Google search engine. It will decide what tool is most suitable to use. Kick off and extract, um, kick off the, the pipeline for running that tool. And then it has the ability to actually observe the output of that tool. So maybe it performs a search or 
with our extractive question answering pipeline and discovers an answer is there were 54 cars. It will make an observation and decide whether that answer makes sense or whether it needs more information to, to answer the initial query. And then it can iteratively go back and use the tool again, um, slightly changing what it's looking for. So maybe it says, oh, you know, I haven't been able to find the answer to Brooklyn. It's instead giving me an answer about Queens. I need to search for Brooklyn again. And then it will do the search, make the observation until it believes that it has responded to your query or until it's run out of the number of processing steps that we've defined for it. So we can actually define the number of iterations that an agent can take before it exits that, that tool observation loop. Type of agent that I've described here or the type of prompting that's behind this agent is called the zero shot react prompting. So react is reason and act. And the thought process I've described is essentially the react reason and act uh, prompting process. The reason that this was invented or put in place is because there is this propensity for large language models to hallucinate. So if you just ask a query directly, sometimes it responds with something that sounds plausible, but isn't actually plausible. And what researchers have found is that you can reduce the propensity for a large language model to hallucinate if you use this type of react prompting that I've just briefly described here. Great. So what does this all look like in the code itself? Let's jump into that. We define our AI agent in just 47 lines of code. And a lot of that is the React prompting itself. Again, Haystack being the, the powerful library, it gives you all of the APIs you need to define the agent, making this whole thing, you know, building this whole thing end to end quite simple. The first thing I'll draw your attention to is the prompt template. And I will just read this out to you, but you know, feel free to read along on the screen uh, or pause it at this point to get this, to make sure you're comprehending what this looks like. So here's the prompt for our agent. And you can see how this relates to the react prompting that I was describing earlier. You are a helpful and knowledgeable agent. To achieve your goal of answering complex questions correct correctly, you have access to the following tools. And notice here, this is a variable tool names with descriptions. And you know the significance of this will become more obvious as I describe the agent to you and how we define it. To answer questions, you'll need to go through multiple steps involving step-by-step -step thinking and selecting appropriate tools and their inputs. So selecting both the appropriate tools and their inputs. Tools will respond with observations. When you are ready for a final answer, respond with the final answer colon. Use the following format. Question. The question to be answered, thought reason if you have the final answer <clears throat> if yes answer the question if not find out the missing information needed to answer it tool pick one of the of the tools so there are tool names as we defined tool input the input for the tool observation the tool will respond with the result Final answer, the final answer to the question, be concise, 500 words maximum for tool, tool input and ob observation steps can be repeated multiple times, but sometimes we can find the answer in the first pass. Question, so this is the query from the user for let's think step by step, I first need to. So this is how we kick off the agent. But this is a prompt that we actually feed to the OpenAI large language model, in this case, GPT-4. So here we define our, our prompts node. So in, in, um, 
in Haystack if when we want to define the the large language model that the agent is going to work off, we define it as a as a prompt node. So we can see our model our model path is GPT four, and our default prompt template is the React prompt template that we've defined up here that I've just read through. The API key is obviously the API key to access our GPT-4 model, which is behind the OpenAI um, firewall. And then max length is the length of the response that we're trying to achieve here. And that's in tokens. And then we can actually pass some model quarks into the GPT-4 model. So I've set the temperature to zero to make the response a little, a little bit more deterministic. The idea here is that for the same query, you should get the same response rather than having a range of responses possible. You can play around with that parameter yourself to see what it, it does to your responses. So finally, the tool set. So as mentioned in the, when I was reading out the React prompting, the agent actually has access to tools. But what do we mean when we say tools? So I did touch on this briefly earlier on, but actually our tool in this case is our entire extract, um, our entire question answering, extractive question answering pipeline that we defined earlier. So let's just get back to this diagram to give you a better understanding or intuition of this. So we defined this earlier, our extractive question answering pipeline. This entire pipeline is essentially a tool that the agent can use. So remember, all we're doing here is searching our knowledge base for relevant text or relevant sentences or relevant information. And then we're using the reader to answer the question based on the relevant snippets that the retriever has already isolated from our entire knowledge base. So the agent can kick that process off and understand the output and interpret whether that output answers the user query or not, or whether it needs to kick that off again to respond to the user query. Great. So what are we doing to define this tool? We also part, we obviously pass the name of the tool, which is document Q and A, the pipeline or node. So tools in Haystack in the framework tools can either be an entire pipeline or a, a, a node, just one node of a, of a, um, that doesn't have to be part of a pipeline. So in this case, it's the document Q and A, and you can see that defined here. So we return the document Q and A as when we define our, our make document Q and A pipeline. And then the key thing here is the description. So description gives the agent, which is powered by a large language model, an understanding for what that tool actually is useful for or what that tool does. And this is important that you get this description right, especially as you start providing the agent with multiple tools that it can use. So example, this agent only has access to just one tool for this use case. But let's say I wanted to add a tool that also searches um, a Google search engine, I would need to provide a description of when that tool might be useful to use. So the agent has an idea of when it should and shouldn't use it. And that will vastly impact the performance of your, um, your, your agent. And then the output variable answers. And that's important because we've already defined that the output here is going to be some kind of answer that the agent needs to, to analyze. And there you go. So that's how we define our agent. We just simply use the add tool method and the search tool that we've already defined here. We add that to the agent. Okay, fantastic. So we have effectively defined our entire retrieval augmentation uh, generation enabled large language model. I've shown you the code for this, but what about seeing this thing in action? How does this actually work? Let's get into that. Oh, I will. I have actually created a front end for this in Streamlit. I'm not going to go into the details of the front end, but 
this will be available for you in the GitHub repository for this project, which I have provided the link to in the description for this video. So when you get the chance, have a look at the front end yourself just to see how everything works. It is done in Streamlit. It's a bit fiddly to play with because Streamlit, as you know, if you've ever designed any front end in Streamlit, you'll know that this it has this tendency to run the script from the start every single time. And there's things that you need to do to, to stop that happening. But it should be clear to you once you have a look at this script yourself. So what's great is to run a streamlit front end, all you need to do is write um, in the folder of the streamlit app itself, open your terminal and write streamlit run app.py. Obviously it depends on what you've called your streamlit app. I've simply called mine app.py and I'll hit run on that. So this is now executing in the background so you can see the streamlit app is loading up locally there's a local host there and we can see it's running so i've put several things in place to detail when the streamlit app is running each process to get everything set up and i'm going to show you behind the scenes what that looks like it does take a little bit of time but it's it will give you a better idea of what's happening with the app and how things are building so as you can see, we're running the pre-processing docs step. And if I step into um, the back end for a second, so if I step into the terminal, what you will start to see is, yes. So what you will start to see is the pre-processing step is, is being kicked off. So that's still running the pre-processing doc step and this will take some time. So great. So now we are actually writing our document from the document store. So there's one file in there and that's a PDF file. And now we're creating the embeddings. You can see that here. This is all the steps that we've already talked about um, that I've showed programmatically. And if I step into the Streamlit app, you can see it's building the question answer pipeline. So that is the pipeline that we use to create our, to do the, the search, um, the retrieval and search. So part of that is actually building out our document store in the first place and um, creating those sentence embeddings. So you can see that process happening here. It does take some time. So just, uh, Yeah, you will have to if you. Fantastic. So the app is ready to use. Just realizing I haven't mentioned what document that we've actually given our large language model access to through this retrieval augmented generation process. It's worth talking a bit about that. So I'll pull that up just to give you a view. So in our document store, in our database, we have a Wikipedia article that I have downloaded as a PDF. And it's all about the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. Now, granted, I understand this is a sensitive topic, but the reason I have chosen this topic in particular is that we have an entire Wikipedia article written here about an event that occurred um, from 2022. And we can be sure that our chat GPT model doesn't have access to any of this information. And it serves as a good test for the power of retrie retrieval augmented generation, which I'm about to demonstrate here. 
that you can see this article is 82 pages so that's quite a large knowledge base granted a lot of it is actually references so you can see here from about the 36th page it's just references back to back but we do have a significant knowledge base to draw from great so let's proceed let's put our retrieval augmented generation enabled large language model to the test So I've already prepared some questions to ask relevant to the Ukraine war. And for this purpose of this video, I'll only do one because it does take a little bit of time and there's a few details that I want to share with you. However, there is a technical blog that accompanies this video. And as soon as that's published, I'll leave the description in the, I'll leave the link to that technical blog in the description and you can read that for yourself to get a better intuition and see some of the other questions I have asked. Okay. So the question I'm going to ask the model is something very specific about the conflict, um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Oh, I'll start off by asking chat GPT. So the question is who led the IAEA team that investigated the plant on 29th August 2022. So you can imagine what the response is going to be here from ChatGPT if I ask this question. Again, it doesn't actually provide the answer to the question because we get this thing here. It's like an automatic thing that says, you know, its knowledge is cut off at September 2021. Gives us a view about uh, what the IAEA is. So the International Atomic Energy Agency, right? But it doesn't answer our question. Now, this is a great example to demonstrate the power of a RAG enabled large language model. Let's see what our RAG enabled large language model manages to come up with. So the same question, who led the IAEA team that investigated the plant on 29th August 2022? So hitting submit here, we're running and you can see the agents working and I'm just going to show you what's happening behind the scenes. So this is our React framework actually in place. So you can see the query here. Who led the IAEA team that investigated the plant on the 29th of August? Parameters, and then we can see what the agent is actually doing step by step. So find out what the IAE is and which plant was investigated on the 29th. Then I need to find out who led the team that conducted the investigation. I don't have this information at hand, so I will use the document QA tool to find it. And that's the tool that we actually defined um, earlier on that is our uh, retrieval and reader node combined. So that's our pipeline and it's great. So let's use the tool. tool. Tool input is our initial query. And then it's got an observation, a response from the tool, which is Raphael Grossi. So then the large language model um, based on that React prompting framework has now come with a response. The document QA tool has provided the name Raphael Grossi. In the response to the query, this suggests that Raphael Grossi led the IAE team that I that investigated the plant on the 29th of August 2022. I don't need any more information to answer the question. Final answer, Raphael Grossi led the IAE a team that investigated the plant on the 29th of August 2022. Fantastic. So you can see the reasoning steps of the agent here with that React prompting, which is really useful for tracing back how your agent got to the answer. And if we wanted, we could actually output this in a chat like framework. So here we go. So for the response here, we get our final answer, which we saw in the background as the agent was working and, you know, we get the final thought there as well. Great. So hopefully that demonstrates the power of retrieval augmented generation to actually enhance the capabilities of your large language models. You can see there the difference between ChatGPT, where it didn't have access to that knowledge base and couldn't answer our question versus our retrieval augmented 
um, generation enabled model, which then does have access to the knowledge base. Now, there might be a few things you're thinking here. And the first of which might be, okay, great, but why don't I just paste that PDF into ChatGPT and ask it the question based on that. Now you can, but that doesn't work for much longer documents. So as you saw there, we had about 86 pages of wiki there. Now imagine that's a policy document or a regulatory document that you wanted to ask some questions about. ChatGPT isn't going to be able to take that length of context to answer questions. So using RAG is a great way to answer questions on much longer context of documents. The second thing is on the time it takes. So I did touch a little bit about the latency here and the infrastructure, the, the speed it takes to first of all, generate that document store itself and also the latency of the agent responding. This can all be solved by building this out on the correct infrastructure. So I'm not using any GPUs here. This is just purely all on CPUs, but you know, generating our sentence embeddings, I think we can use GPUs to do some of those operations in parallel, which would vastly speed that up. We can also have a persistent sentence embedding database, um, a persistent vector store, vector store, which would mean that we wouldn't have to generate those embedding sentence embeddings from scratch every single time. We could just pull from the data store that the vector store that already exists. That would save some of the, the speed issues here as well. Um, where I see this is very much in, there are a lot of companies and a lot of businesses that require just basically questions and answers from um, policy documents that they already have internally. So previously working at a bank, we had something similar that helped automate a lot of our IT help desk requests. So we had an internal chatbot that basically just had access to the IT policy documents. And you could, instead of speaking to a, uh, an IT analyst, a human IT analyst, you just interact with this chatbot, which was able to solve 90% of your problems. And, you know, obviously relieved the, the workload from the IT team that, so they could concentrate on more strategic objectives rather than having to firefight every single time. I think there's a lot of space for retrieval augmented um, generation enabled large language models in that area of business um, in terms of processing and understanding as a, as a study partner to understand long, top, long text documents as well. So I've seen these things being used for people that are, you know, PhDs that are looking at research papers and having to look at large volumes of research papers instead of perhaps just looking at one, maybe you could have a whole catalog of research papers that you need to investigate and you need to look over quickly and you can use this, this method to do that. Um, policy documents, regulation, regulatory documents as well. Uh, the, the, the use cases here are, are really endless actually. And I think there's a lot of scope in the, in, there's a lot of scope for practical application of this for, for businesses. There is still the potential for these models to hallucinate. And that is something that you need to be aware of. So even with the React prompting framework in place, the model can still hallucinate and return responses that aren't quite right. There is, I think there are ways to around that. And one of the things that I'm exploring is looking at integrating this more into a chat like framework where there's a memory component. And the reason that is, is because if you suspect that the model's hallucinating, you can ask it to regenerate its response, or you can interact with it like that. Like you'd have a conversation with a human being where they've given you an answer to something and you suspect that answer isn't quite correct. And then maybe they look again and go, oh, I made a mistake. Actually, it's this. So having that chat-like interface would, would help with those hallucinations, I believe. And, um, also, there's that trade-off with the sentence embedding that you choose. So I've used an open source sentence embedding, which is, I think it was 768 dimensions, I believe. But there are actually more heavyweight sentence embeddings that you can use. You can use sentence embedding, embedding models directly from the OpenAI API, for example, that might actually increase the performance of your retrieval augmented generation enabled model. And that's something to consider if you want to take this into production. 
would you use a open AI sentence embedding model instead of a open source hugging face sentence embedding model? You might also use a retrieval model, a retriever model that's chained on question answers um, pairs specifically for your use case. So you can use, I just used a model that was generally fine tuned on question answer pairs, but you might want to fine tune that even further for the domain that you are operating in, which could in fact improve the performance of your your um performance of your 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 app end to end as well and that's something to consider when taking this into production um that's pretty much it for rag enabled large language models i hope that you have seen the utility of this today as always if you like this video please like um, subscribe to the channel i will be putting out videos like this often if you like this kind of thing and you you want to get into more of the technical details around the generative ai that we're seeing nowadays this is a channel to subscribe to please recommend um, share the video as well um, it would be really grateful we're a small channel so it's 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 every everything helps in terms of getting the getting our content out there as I mentioned in the video, I am the chief data scientist and founder of Data Centric Solutions. We are a data science and AI consultancy, and we specialize in document processing and automating those types of workloads. And that's the gap that I have identified for many businesses that are doing workloads like this that we've just described there manually. And you know, with the generative AI technologies we have today there's plenty of room to automate that. So if you are interested in learning more about that and how that type of document processing, along with much more, can automate your business activities and leave you more time to focus on more strategic aims and focus in the areas that you want to be playing in, please book a consult consultation with me. Um, it's a free consultation and the link to that is directly below the video in the description. And thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed the demo today. Take care.